University in America. And I'm also uh, an honorary visiting researcher in the University of Bradford, so hence my connection to TAG, and I'm from my PhD at Bradford, so I have a sort of British perspective on landscape archaeology, which is the whole reason that I'm giving this talk about rock art landscapes rather than about rock art. So it'd be really interesting, given this morning's half of the, this session, to kind of think about how the themes we explored earlier articulate with these. Because really, what I'm interested in is how we see time, place, and space articulating together and thinking about those connections. So I'll try not to wander too much because I'm conscious that I'm near a microphone. If I do stray, just raise your hands because I tend to wander around as a landscape archaeologist. I don't want to stand still. <laughs> so I'm going to just point out this bit of my abstract, which I tend to, you know, I like to think about what did I put in the abstract and why did I want to do this paper? And I wrote about the orange bits being on the rocks and noticing them after a little while looking at it, and they're not immediately obvious to you. And that's how I felt when I first went to Deer Valley Petroglyph Preserve, which I proposed to do a project there before even visiting the place, because the visitor center had been shut for renovations for about a year. And so I had just, I knew that this place existed. I wanted to do a postdoc somewhere, and it was a fantastic landscape that was crying out to be investigated. And something that struck me when I got there was that, you know, this place will obviously outlive me. And, you know, that just evokes a great sense of time for an archaeologist. But I was wondering if the average visitor to the site really felt the same way. If people made that same sort of connection and placing themselves in the story. And that's something that I explored during my PhD, landscape biographies, and thinking about the place of people in wider connections. And so the point of my postdoc is not to analyze what the rock art means. Someone else has already gone into that. Um, I'm really interested in resituating the rock art in visitors' experiences and to get them to think slightly differently about the place. And hopefully that will then challenge traditional narratives that people either bring to the site or which have been presented and which completely not miss the landscape element, but sort of they keep it very quiet and it's sort of in the background and I want to bring that to the forefront even just for a moment in people's experiences when they come to this place. And so I'm working on a project which is just over a year long and it's a combination of my own research interests about landscape biographies and the wishes and goals of the Centre for Archaeology and Society who employ me and their combination of archaeologists and museum studies professionals so I have a sort of an interesting group of people around me to give me new ideas and to bounce ideas off of. And the project, uh, it tries to respect the wishes of descendant communities. There are several native communities who believe that their ancestors made these, and in, you know, in order to honor their wishes, all of my work is not destructive and photography based, or it's based in an archive. Um, some of that work which was done previously was destructive, but the idea is to not do that again, and to see what we can do with the existing data and the landscape itself, which I would argue has been understudied in terms of and how we represent it to the public and what they make of it. So, as I mentioned, I'm really interested in landscape biographies. And when I did my PhD, I had sort of, you know, heard about biographies in terms of sites and houses and uh, objects. And I thought I invented this wonderful thing. Oh, I'm going to scale up and then realize that it's very well established. And it's a concept that's been used in geography since the 1970s. And archaeology has taken off with it. And it's quite fashionable. And it's not just about thinking about life histories of places. It's not just about the order in which things happened in chronology. It's more about the connections through space and time. <clears throat> Excuse me, through space and time. And thinking about how a place fits into the wider narrative that we tell about time. And so for this session, I'm really going to talk about the visual aspects of this landscape. And you know, there are loads of other things which I'm interested in exploring, but today I'm going to try to focus on the ways that this particular site articulates with visuality. And so, you know, obviously rock art in itself is a visual medium, but also the archive, which I have to draw upon, which I'll talk about later, that's visual. And it, you know, it was one of the earliest uses of GIS in archaeology. And so that's a really interesting point for me to think about as a modern landscape archaeologist. And then the ways that it's presented in the museum are also quite visual. And so I've just put a few points up there about you know, seeing as part of placemaking. And so for most of us who don't have any visual impairments, when we go out into a landscape, we look around with our eyes and that forms how we then understand ourselves and our place in the world. And you know, there are many ways of seeing and understanding the past. 
of which archaeology is only one, and I'm very conscious to point out that there are descendant communities who have histories about this place and about the other places in the landscape surrounding this site. And I can't speak for them because it's not my history to tell. But there are published accounts of, for example, Afghan creation myths, um, creation stories, and how they articulate with archaeology. And there's been some recent work trying to bridge the gap between archaeology and native histories and overcoming these sort of you know, theoretical divides. And even after starting this project, I realized that my term prehistoric social landscapes is quite problematic because there are many archaeologists in the region who don't agree with the term prehistory for this place because it has a legacy of colonialism, which of course coming from a UK PhD, I feel horrible now. So in future, when I discuss this project, you know, hopefully any publications that come out will not be prehistoric landscapes. But that unfortunately is what I named it before realizing that there are these legacies, which unfortunately are very, you know, time is interwoven in that. How we even discuss this period is very difficult. So with all of that in mind, thinking about how then the average visitor comes and sees the site, you know, I sort of think, oh, well, there's quite a lot to deal with. And so Arizona is in the southwest of America, uh, North America, and it's sandwiched between California and Mexico. And it's a quite dry place, but luckily we have two monsoons a year, so you do get some greenery, very prickly greenery. And the site is on a basalt outcrop on the Hedgepeth Hills. And it's in the northwest of Phoenix. Uh, you can see all these dots on the map are Hoacom sites. So this is the main period we're talking about in the first and second millennium AD. And it was an agricultural society which had extensive canal systems. There are also uh, some settlements, probably seasonal and other activity sites further out, which would have relied on rainwater falling off of the hills and mountains coming down to feed crops. And we get rock art sites all over the place, which is again something I'm not going to talk about today because that's a whole paper in and of itself. So I'm really going to focus on Deer Valley, which was investigated in the 1970s and 80s ahead of the construction of the Adobe Dam. And the whole point of doing that was that the city of Phoenix was expanding dramatically and all of these you know, biannual monsoons were flooding all the nice roads and housing estates and people were starting to think, how can we better manage our water? And so as mitigation for this, uh, the archaeologist Jay Simon Bruder went out with her team and they surveyed all the rock art and tried to map it as accurately as possible and try to glean as much information from it in order to then propose how to best go about creating a dam without destroying as much archaeology as might have been. Um, and they also found some small scale settlement, probably seasonal, there's a pit house, which dates to the whole calm period, which I've put the broad dates up there, the dates are a bit uh, up to debate. The Hoacom period comes after the Archaic, where we have hunter-gatherers, so they are living and working in the region, and we do have some evidence of Archaic rock art. Uh, there's actually, I've put, let's see if this works. Uh -huh. So here we go. Here is what has been interpreted as an atlatl, which does not occur archaeologically in the Hoacom period, so people have suggested that this is most likely a piece of rock art created by Archaic people. And then we have more traditional Ho'okam uh, motifs, and those are what make up the majority of the site. There are about 1,500 petroglyphs spread over many, many, many boulders, and I'll show you a distribution later to show you exactly where they fit on the hillside. But what's also interesting to note is that there are battalion uh, petroglyphs, which are broadly contemporary with the Ho'okam, but from the far west of the state. So this would have taken, I mean, today it takes several hours to drive there. It would have been quite a journey. And actually, that's not surprising when we listen to native histories about long distance movement, people moving around and having connections across what we would consider archaeologically cultural groups. And so it suggests that this is a very mobile landscape, even people who are farming and settled and have invested massive amounts of time and energy in canal systems. And I've just put a few challenges up there to the interpretation of rock art in the Southwest. Actually, there are quite similar challenges about rock art everywhere. First, we heard earlier about dating techniques and very unfortunately, at this site, uh, there was an experimental technique done during the first investigation, which was not successful at all. And it was to date the desert varnish that you know, sort of accumulates on top of the motifs as layers of uh, minerals and microbial activity start depositing more and more discoloration and they sort of, it almost, they fade back into the rock. Unfortunately, that didn't have very high resolution for this region 
and it was exceedingly destructive. You have to take a giant core out of the petroglyph, so that's now absolutely frowned upon, and we don't do that. So I'm looking at just broad chronologies. I'm not looking at any really high resolution stuff, and that's something that perhaps would be a challenge for the future. And also just questions about what these petroglyphs mean. You know, I, again, as I said, I am not a native person, so I don't feel that I could ascribe particular meaning to particular petroglyphs or particular uh, reasons for doing it. However, I'm interested in process and how this works with the whole landscape. And this is what it looks like. As I said, it's a very wet place sometimes in the year, but for the most time, it is very, very dry and hot. And so this actually was sort of a challenge to white settlers who came in mostly the 19th and 20th centuries. And this is the earliest aerial photo we have on the site from 1940. Um, I'll just point it out. We are looking here <coughs> and here. And I'll just flip through time. You can see that in the 40s and the 50s and 60s, there wasn't much going on in terms of agriculture and settlement. By the time we get to the 70s, we have a housing estate being built. And then the dam goes in. And so this is after those initial investigations, and that's what it looks like we've got today. We have lots of very nice LIDAR, and hopefully in the next few months, we're going to be doing some drone-based photogrammetry to get even better resolution topographically. But as I said, this is all concentrated on one side of the hill, and that you know, suggests that there's intentionality, that people are going back and telling stories. And I'm just gonna quickly go through these subconscious of time. But these are some examples of what Bruder and her team used to record uh, originally the petroglyphs. And this is an example of the earliest GIS that they had access to, which was actually developed at Arizona State University, based. And I've just put this quote up here from David Hockney about this connection between the way we depict space and how we behave in it. Because this sort of GIS flat view of the site is how it's traditionally been presented, that, you know, we're looking at all of the petroglyphs stretched out in a very Western way of looking at it, and it sort of loses time depth. So what I've been interested in is using reflectance transformation imaging, which is a form of recording with photos where you move the light around if you just watch the light source, and it gathers depth information just by looking at shadows and highlights. And so we can end up with a model, which you know we've been doing it sort of experimentally in full desert sun, which is not usually what usually you do in sort of low lighting conditions, but we've still got pretty excellent results. So here we have petroglyphs, which are quite difficult for visitors to see midday when many of them might come out to visit. And it's been useful in looking at gaps in the knowledge that we have. So this on the left, we have one of the original recordings from Bruder's team, and they recorded a one pole ladder and a single foot. And this is the RTI on the right, which is still a bit difficult to see. But if I change the contrast, you can see that we have the one pole ladder, a foot, and another foot, which was completely missed. And actually, I went back to this rock with my boss several times, and we walked past it about four times before we realized where it was. And it just shows that, you know, in terms of accessibility, most visitors, our audience, might just completely miss that, and they won't be able to engage with it. And so all of this hopefully will lead to a museum exhibit which will explore these biographies, and which will try to tie together all these layers of the landscape and how we are part of the story and so that's something that perhaps we could discuss more in the in our discussion how we then bring ourselves and our visitors into this biography to make them realize that you know this very deep time actually has some sort of relationship to us and so i'll just leave those up there to think about whilst we have questions